What's up? I am David Long. This is a clip I made from a video about Bernardo Castrup and his small theory of everything. Bernardo is one of these doctor science seeming dudes who Deepak surrounds himself with to try and make himself look legit. I'm making a debunked video about him. If you want, when you get done watching this video, go check out that one and consider subscribing and checking out other videos on my channel. Enjoy. So let's just rewind back to 2010, when Deepak Chopra tried to bring up a lot of these ideas, especially related to quantum physics, in a room with a bunch of actual scientists. In deference to Sam Harris, he said, don't go the way of quantum physics. I think I'm going to have to say that science is now in a process of overthrowing the superstition of materialism. That everything that we call matter comes from something that is not material. That the essential nature of the physical world is that it's not physical. That the essential stuff of the universe is non-stuff. Call it what you will. And science also tells us, and if there are any scientists who want to disagree with them, please come up during the question and answer session. Science tells us that nature is a discontinuity, that it's an on-off phenomenon that there are gaps between every two ons, where you find a field of possibilities, a field of pure potentiality. Science doesn't call it God, but what is God if not the immeasurable potential of all that was, all that is, and all that will be. Science also tells us that it's a field of non-locality, where everything is correlated with everything else. My uh, adversaries are going to point out, no, no, everything, God is explained by neurology. Well, I hope today, Michael, that you will convert from a skeptic to a neuroskeptic because your science is really frozen in the dungeons of conservatism and in the dungeons of orthodoxy. Today, science tells us that the essential nature of reality is non-local correlation. Everything is connected to everything else. That there's hidden creativity. There are quantum leaps of creativity. That there's something called the observer effect where intention orchestrates space-time events which we then measure as movement and motion and energy and matter. We can have a personal relationship with this intelligence because we have a consciousness that is part of the sea of consciousness. And all you have to do is understand the principles of science and understand that you have within you the resources to intuitively grasp this mystery. But one of the things we have to do today, my friends at Caltech, you have given us this opportunity that you have to stop being the jihadists and the Vatican of conservative and orthodox science, which is not relevant anymore. You asked what I meant by woo-woo. That is the very embodiment of woo-woo. He said, stringing together at a rapid patter a bunch of scientific sounding words sprinkled in with some spiritual new age words is doesn't mean anything. I hope that no, hang on, scientists hang on, here in this audience. Yes. By the way, scientists are not jihadists here. This is Caltech. We're not jihadists. That was really very unspiritual of you. This non-local quantum effects were all connected. No, this is not true. When quantum physicists talk about non-locality and the interconnectedness of things, they're talking about things at the quantum level. And there's no reason to think that it's active at the level of the brain. When you talk about the observer effect and the uncertainty principle, this is how subatomic particles are altered by looking at them, by bombarding them with light, for example, because they're so small. And so you look at it or you don't look at it, and that changes the nature of what you're looking at. But the moon is really there whether you look at it or not. It doesn't apply to the macro world. In the absence of a conscious entity, the moon remains a radically ambiguous and ceaselessly flowing quantum soup that you have to have a conscious being. The moon? Oh, oh, yes. Okay, listen to the sounds in the room. The deeper point here, and this is where the whole style and content of what you're saying is so deeply unscientific, is that there's not a physicist sitting on this stage right now. Okay, I would never be tempted to lecture a room full of a thousand people at Caltech about physics. I'm not a physicist. You're not a physicist. And basically every sentence demonstrates that, that you speak on the subject. Now, please don't take this as an ad hominem, but what you do and what many people who try to invoke spooky physics do in the service of propping up their religious and new age intuitions is that they think that because quantum mechanics is spooky and difficult to understand, and because what you're saying is spooky and difficult to understand, they must somehow be related, or they must somehow be mutually supportive. And that's just fundamentally not true. They're arrived at by completely different methodologies and ways of thinking and criteria of discursive evidence. I've studied with great mystics. I've met great meditation masters who've spent 20 years in caves perfecting the kinds of techniques of meditation that you would adopt or recommend. They don't know a damn thing about physics. And they're not interested, for the most part, in physics. I mean, there's nothing about sitting in a cave and, granted, having incredibly useful and, and even normative experiences and transforming your way of life and transforming your moment, moment perception of the world. There's nothing about that project that makes you a theoretical physicist. These are completely different language games, and you have just merged them together in a very unprincipled way. This is a game. It's a game that is designed for export to people who don't know much science and don't know how science is done. You're not a theoretical physicist. 
The way science is done is I invite theoretical right physicists in this audience to actually address this oh, question. Okay, so a theoretical physicist will be comfortable talking with real confidence in a very narrow band of his expertise, and he will be exquisitely sensitive to the fact that whenever he opens his mouth in a room like this, he is guaranteed to be speaking in front of half a dozen people who know more on any given issue than he does. The great irony of, of the popular conception of science as arrogant is that when you go to a scientific meeting, you're about as likely to see real arrogance as you're likely to see nudity. People are constantly offering caveats and hedges toward what they said. Every statement is couched in, I'm sure there's someone in the room who knows more about this than me, but because everyone is desperate to avoid public embarrassment. And this seems to be something you're not doing. <laughs> If I was worried about being embarrassed, I wouldn't be actually influencing the people that I'm influencing. And so, Leonard, you are a quantum physicist? I'm a theoretical physicist, and I'm also writing a book with Stephen Hawking. Would you like to have a short course in quantum mechanics sometime so that we can straighten out your misuse of quantum notation? <laughs> what is it about Deepak's use of quantum physics that bothers you? The term non-local, uh, the use was not correct. I think consciousness is non-local. Yeah, you know, I've never really run across a definition of consciousness that I understood. So maybe you could te teach me something. And a I can... superposition of possibilities. Okay, well, <laughs> all right. I, I, uh, I know what all each of those words means. I, I still don't think I, I know. I mean, you see where it would come from, right? Because quantum mechanics says what the world is is different than what we see when we look at it. So it's a small leap from that correct statement to we bring the world into existence by looking at it, right? right. And then you're Deepak Chopra. And Deepak, uh. is, he's found me on Twitter. So whenever I tweet something about quantum mechanics, he you know retweets it with something. But it's all in your mind. It's all consciousness bringing the world into existence. He loves word salad. Yeah. That guy is the biggest dealer of word salad yeah. that the world has and ever known. And the genius known. is putting them the word salad into a recipe that people think is nutritious for them, right? <laughs> they, they really like to eat, even though there's no actual nutritional value. Well, a friend of mine gave me a Deepak Chopra book and I started going through it and I was like I go you know this guy's crazy right, like, right. I mean, yeah, yeah. he probably wants to do well like, he's probably not a terrible person but he's also ignoring the actual scientists that study all this stuff yeah. and he's pitching this thing this sort of like pseudo quasi spiritual view of the world but the reason why Deepak can do that is because most people don't understand what he's talking about I see what you're doing you're throwing a bunch of very complicated words that aren't in most people's vernacular and you're saying them in a way that makes me feel like you have some sort of a connection to the the chi and to the chakras and to the the inner whatever that everybody's trying to reach to be happy. Yeah, and another problem is just that whenever there is a field, whether it's physics or medicine or whatever, where we know something, but it's hard, complicated, counterintuitive, when we explain it, we translate it, right? You know, in physics, we have mathematical equations that are quite unambiguous as to what they say, but then we use words. We say, well, there's a cloud, there's a probability, etc. And every translation is inaccurate in some sense. So if you are basing your beliefs off the translations, then you can fudge them a little bit more to get almost wherever you want to go. So at this point in history, it might just be a well-known fact that Deepak Chopra is the go-to archetype of New Age woo and nonsensical word salad have been subjected to a kind of word salad of scientific jargon used out of context inappropriately, apparently uncomprehendingly. I would like to remind you that ad hominem is a logical fallacy and that's science 101. You should know that. Ad hominem means talking I, about... This is my turn to speak, sir. Okay? You accuse me of jargon. You accuse me of misusing language. How many people understood what I was saying? You're lying! Since this debate that he had with Sam Harris and Michael Shermer, it doesn't really seem like he's learned more about quantum physics. What it seems like Deepak has actually learned is to surround himself with people who can look like they're doing real science or seem like they're actually intellectual and appealing to real science. Instead of relying upon the hopefully sympathetic theoretical physicist in the audience, Deepak is going to provide his own pseudoscientists to try and make reasonable seeming cases for his worldview. Thanks everybody for watching. Make sure you subscribe and ring the bell and like the video and buy the merch. Support on Patreon, like all of my other beautiful Patreon supporters who I love the most. Join the I Am David Long Friends and Fans Facebook group where all the good conversations are going down. Watch the next video, all the calls to action. Thanks very much. Peace!